Chapter eighteen, part fourteen of volume two of a popular history of France from the earliest times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume two of a popular history of France from the earliest times by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter eighteen. The Kingship in France, part fourteen. On the 2nd of February, 1300, Boniface the Eighth, who had much at heart the lustre and popularity of the Holy See, published a bull which granted indulgences to the pilgrims who should that year, and every centenary to come, visit the church of the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul at Rome. At this first celebration of the centenarian Christian jubilee, the concourse was immense. The most moderate historians say that there were never fewer than a hundred thousand pilgrims at Rome others put the numbers as high as two hundred thousand, and contemporary poetry as well as history has celebrated this pious assemblage of Christians, of every nation, language, and age, around the tomb of their fathers in the faith. The old man with white hair goeth far away, says Petrarch, Sonnet 14, from the sweet haunts where his life hath been passed, and from his little family astonished to find their dear father missing. As for him, in the last days of his age, broken down by weight of years, and a weary of the road, he draggeth along as best he may by force of willing spirit his old and tottering limbs, and cometh to Rome to fulfil his desire of seeing the image of him whom he hopeth to see ere long up yonder in the heavens. The success of the measure and the solemn homage of Christendom filled with joy and proud confidence the heart of the septuagenarian pontiff. He had three years before decreed to Louis the Ninth, the most Christian of the kings of France, the honours of canonization and the title of saint. Being chosen as a mediator in 1298 by the kings of France and England in a war which pressed heavily on both, the decree of arbitration which he pronounced, favourable rather to Philip than to Edward I, had been accepted by both of them, and the Pope, on laying his injunctions upon them with some severity of language, had exhibited authority in a manner salutary for both kingdoms. Everything seemed at that time to smile on Boniface, and to invite him to believe himself the real sovereign of Christendom. An opportunity for a splendid confirmation of his universal supremacy in the Christian world came to tempt him. A quarrel had arisen between Philip and the Archbishop of Narbonne on the subject of certain dues claimed by both in that great diocese. Boniface was loud in his advocacy of the Archbishop against the officers of the king. "'If, my son, thou tolerate such enterprises against the churches of thy kingdom,' he wrote to Philip, on the 18th of July, 1300, Thou mayest thereafter have reasonable fear, lest God, the author of judgments and the king of kings, exact vengeance for it, and assuredly his vicar will not, in the long run, keep silence. Though he wait a while patiently, in order not to close the door to compassion, there will be full need at last that he rouse himself for the punishment of the wicked and the glory of the good. Nor did Boniface content himself with writing. He sent to Paris, to support his words, Bernard de Cessé, whom he, on his own authority, had just appointed Bishop of Pamiers. The choice of bishops was not yet, at that time, subject to any fixed and generally recognized rule. Most often it was the chapter of the diocese that elected its bishop, with a subsequent application for the approbation of the king and the pope. Sometimes the king, and also the pope, made such appointments directly and independently. Boniface the Eighth had quite recently created a new bishopric at Pamiers in order to immediately appoint it to Bernard de Cessé, hitherto simple abbot of St. Antonine in that city. Bernard, who was devoted to his patron, was further a passionate Languedocian and a foe to the dominion of the French kings of the north over southern France, and he gave himself out as a personal descendant of the last counts of Toulouse. On arriving in Paris as the Pope's legate, he made use there of violent and inconsiderate language. He even affirmed, it was said, that St. Louis had predicted the disappearance of his line in the third generation, and that King Philip was only an illegitimate descendant of Charlemagne. He was accused of having incessantly labored to excite revolts against the king in the south, at one time for the advantage of the local lords, at another in favor of foreign enemies of the kingdom. Being summoned before the king and his council at Senlis, October 14, 1301, he denied, but with an air of arrogance and aggression, the accusations against him. Philip had at that time, as his chief counsellors, lay lawyers, 
servants passionately attached to the kingship. They were Peter Flott, his chancellor, William of Nogaret, judge-major at Beaucaire, and William of Placien, lord of Vezinogre, the two latter belonging, as Bernard de Sassé belonged, to southern France, and determined to withstand in the south as well as the north the dominion of ecclesiastics. They in their turn rose up against the doctrine and language of the bishop of Pamiers. He was arrested and committed to the keeping of the archbishop of Narbonne, and Philip sent to Rome his chancellor Peter Flott himself, and William of Nogaret, with orders to demand of the Pope, that he should avenge the wrongs of God, the King, and the whole kingdom, by depriving of his orders and every clerical privilege that man whose longer life would taint the places he inhabited, and this in order that the King might make of him a sacrifice to God in the way of justice, for there could be no hope of his amendment if he were suffered to live, seeing that from his youth up he had always lived ill, and that baseness and abandonment only became more and more confirmed in him by inveterate habit. To this violent and threatening language Boniface replied by changing the venue to his own personal tribunal in the case of the Bishop of Pamiers. "'We do bid thy majesty,' he wrote to the king, "'to give this bishop free leave to depart and come to us, for we do desire his presence. We do warn thee to have all his goods restored to him, not to stretch out for the future thy rapacious hands toward the like things, and not to offend the divine majesty or the dignity of the apostolic see, lest we be forced to employ some other remedy.' For thou must know that, unless thou canst allege some excuse founded on reason and truth, we do not see how thou shouldst escape the sentence of the holy canons for having laid rash hands on this bishop. My power, the spiritual power, said the Pope to the Chancellor of France, embraces the temporal, and excludes it. Be it so, answered Peter Flott, but your power is nominal, the king's real. Here was a coarse challenge hurled by the crown at the tiara, and Boniface the Eighth unhesitatingly accepted it. But instead of keeping the advantage of a defensive position by claiming, in the name of lawful right, the liberties and immunities of the Church, he assumed the offensive against the kingship by proclaiming the supremacy of the Holy See in things temporal, as well as spiritual, and by calling upon Philip the Handsome to acknowledge it. On the 5th of December, 1301, he addressed to the king, commencing with the words, Hearken, most dear son, Asculta carissima fili, a long bull, in which, with circumlocutions and expositions full of obscurity and subtlety, he laid down and affirmed, at bottom, the principle of the final sovereignty of the spiritual power, being of divine origin, over every temporal power, being of human creation. In spite of the insufficiency of our deserts, said he, God hath established us above kings and kingdoms by imposing upon us, in virtue of the apostolic office, the duty of plucking away, destroying, dispersing, dissipating, building up and planting in his name and according to his doctrine, to the end that, in tending the flock of the Lord, we may strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken limbs, raise the fallen, and pour wine and oil into all wounds. Let none, then, most dear son, persuade thee that thou hast no superior, and that thou art not subject to the sovereign head of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, for he who so thinketh is beside himself, and if he obstinately affirm any such thing, he is an infidel, and hath no place any longer in the fold of the good shepherd. At the same time Boniface summoned the bishops of France to a council at Rome, in order to labor for the preservation of the liberties of the Catholic Church, the reformation of the kingdom, the amendment of the king, and the good government of France. Philip the Handsome and his counselors did not misconceive the tendency of such language, however involved and full of specious reservations it might be. The final supremacy of the Pope in the body politic, and over all sovereigns, meant the absorption of the laic community in the religious, and the abolition of the state's independence, not in favor of the national church, but to the advantage of the foreign head of the universal church. The defenders of the French kingship formed a better estimate, than was formed at Rome, of the effect which would be produced by such doctrine on France, in the existing condition of the French mind. They entered upon no theological and abstract polemics. They confined themselves entirely to setting in a vivid light the Pope's pretensions and their consequences, feeling sure that, by confining themselves to this question, they would enlist in their opposition not only all laymen, nobles, and commoners, but the greater part of the French ecclesiastics themselves, who were no strangers to the feeling of national patriotism, 
and to whom the Pope's absolute power in the body politic was scarcely more agreeable than the King's. In order to make a strong impression upon the public mind, there was published at Paris, as the actual text of the Pope's bull, a very short summary of his long bull, hearken, most dear son, in the following terms. Boniface, bishop, servant of the servants of God, to Philip, king of the French, fear thou God, and keep his commandments. We would have thee to know that thou art subject unto us in things spiritual and temporal. The presentation to benefices and prebends appertaineth to thee in no wise. If thou have the keeping of certain vacancies, thou art bound to reserve the revenues of them for the successors to them. If thou have made any presentations, we declare them void and revoke them. We consider as heretics all those who believe otherwise. Together with this document there was put in circulation the king's answer to the Pope, in the following terms. Philip, by the grace of God, king of the French, to Boniface, who giveth himself out for sovereign pontiff, little or no greeting. Let thy extreme fatuity know that we be subject to none in things temporal, that the presentation to churches and prebends that be vacant belongeth to us of kingly right, and that the revenues therefrom be ours, that presentations already made or to be made be valid both now and hereafter, and we will firmly support the possessors of them to thy face and in thy teeth, and we do hold as senseless and insolent those who think otherwise. The Pope disavowed, as a falsification, the summary of his long bull, and there is nothing to prove that the unseemly and insulting letter of Philip the Handsome was sent to Rome. But at the bottom the situation of affairs remained the same. Indeed, it did not stop where it was. On the 11th of February, 1302, the bull, hearken, most dear son, was solemnly burned at Paris in the presence of the king and a numerous multitude. Philip convoked, for the 8th of April following, an assembly of the barons, bishops, and chief ecclesiastics, and of deputies from the communes to the number of two or three for each city, all being summoned to deliberate on certain affairs which in the highest degree concern the king, the kingdom, the churches, and all and sundry. This assembly, which really met on the 10th of April at Paris, in the church of Notre Dame, is reckoned in French history as the first states-general. The three estates wrote separately to Rome, the clergy to the Pope himself, the nobility and deputies of the communes to the cardinals, all, however, protesting against the Pope's pretensions in matters temporal, the two laic orders writing in a rough and threatening tone, the clergy making an appeal to the wisdom and paternal clemency of the Holy Father, with tearful accents and psalms mingled with their tears. The king evidently had on his side the general feeling of the nation, and the news from Rome was not of a kind to pacify him. In spite of the king's formal prohibition, forty-five French bishops had repaired to the council summoned by the Pope for All Saints' Day, 1302, and after this meeting a papal decree of November 18th had declared, There be two swords, the temporal and the spiritual. Both are in the power of the church, but one is held by the church herself, the other by kings only with the assent and by sufferance of the sovereign pontiff. Every human being is subject to the Roman pontiff, and to believe this is necessary to salvation. Philip made a seizure of the temporalities of such bishops as had been present at that council, and renewed his prohibition forbidding them to leave the kingdom. Boniface ordered those who had not been to Rome to attend there within three months, and the cardinal of St. Marcellinus, the legate of the Holy See, called a fresh council in France itself, without the king's knowledge. On both sides there were at one time words of conciliation and attempts to keep up appearances of respect, at another new explosions of complaints and threats, but amidst all these changes of languages the struggle was day by day becoming more violent, and preparations were being made by both parties for something other than threats. On the 12th of March and the 13th of June, 1303, at two assemblies of barons, prelates, and legists held at the Louvre, in presence of the king, which several historians have considered to have been states-general, one of the crown's most intimate advisers, William of Placian, proposed against Boniface a form of accusation which imputed to him, beyond his ambition and his claims to absolutism, crimes as improbable as they were hateful. It was demanded that the church should be governed by a lawful pope, and the king, as defender of the faith, was pressed to appeal to the convocation of a general council. On the 24th of June, in the palace garden, a great crowd of people assembled, and after a sermon preached in French, the form of accusation against Boniface, and the appeal to the future council, were solemnly made public. 
The Pope, meanwhile, did not remain idle. He protested against the imputations of which he was the subject. Forty years ago, he said, we were admitted a doctor of laws, and learned that both powers, the temporal and the spiritual, be ordained of God. Who can believe that such fatuity can have entered into our mind? But who can also deny that the king is subject unto us on a score of sin? We be disposed to grant unto him every grace. So long as I was cardinal, I was French in heart. Since then, we have testified how we do love the king. Without us, he would not have even one foot on the throne. We do know all the secrets of the kingdom. We do know how the Germans, the Burgundians, and the folk who speak the Yacht tongue do love the king. If he mend not, we shall know how to chastise him, and treat him as a little boy, sicut unum garcionum, though greatly against our will. On the 13th of April Boniface declared Philip excommunicate if he persisted in preventing the prelates from attending at Rome. Philip, being warned, affected the arrest at Troy of the priest who was bringing the Pope's letter to his legate in France. The legate took to flight. Boniface, on his side, being warned that the king was appealing against him to an approaching council, declared by a bull, on the 15th of August, that it appertained to him alone to summon a council. After this bull there was full expectation that another would be launched, which would pronounce the deposition of the king. And a new bull was actually prepared at Rome on the 5th of September, and was to be published on the 8th. It did not expressly depose the king, it merely announced that measures would be taken more serious even than excommunication. Philip had taken his precautions. He had demanded and obtained from the great towns, churches, and universities more than seven hundred declarations of support in his appeal to the future council, and an engagement to take no notice of the decree which might be issued by the Pope to release the king's subjects from their oath of allegiance. Only a few, and amongst them the abbot of Citeaux, gave him a refusal. The order of the Templars gave only a qualified support. At the approaching advent of the new bull which was being anticipated, the king resolved to act still more roughly and speedily. Notification must be sent to the Pope of the king's appeal to the future council. Philip could no longer confide this awkward business to his chancellor, Peter Flott, for he had fallen at Courtrai in the battle against the Flemings. William of Nogaret undertook it, at the same time obtaining from the king a sort of blank commission authorizing and ratifying in advance all that, under the circumstances, he might consider it advisable to do. Notification of the appeal had to be made to the Pope at Agnani, his native town, whither he had gone for refuge, and the people of which, being zealous in his favor, had already dragged in the mud the lilies and banner of France. Nogaret was bold, ruffianly, and clever. He repaired in haste to Florence, to the king's banker, got a plentiful supply of money, established communications in Agnani, and secured above all the cooperation of Schiara Colonna, who was passionately hostile to the Pope, had been formally proscribed by him, and having fallen into the hands of corsairs, had worked at the oar for them during many a year, rather than reveal his name and be sold to Boniface Gaetani. On the 7th of September, 1303, Colonna and his associates introduced Nogaret and his following into Amiani, with shouts of, Death to Pope Boniface! Long live the King of France! The populace, dumbfounded, remained motionless. The Pope, deserted by all, even by his own nephew, tried to touch the heart of Colonna himself, whose only answer was a summons to abdicate, and to surrender at discretion. "'Those be hard words,' said Boniface, and burst into tears. But this old man, seventy-five years of age, had a proud spirit, and a dignity worthy of his rank. "'Betrayed like Jesus,' said he, "'I shall die, but I will die Pope.' He donned the cloak of St. Peter, put the crown of Constantinople upon his head, took in his hands the keys and the cross, and as his enemies drew nigh, he said to them, Here is my neck, and here is my head. There is a tradition of considerable trustworthiness that Sciarra Colonna would have killed him, and did with his mailed hand strike him in the face. Nogaret, however, prevented the murder, and confined himself to saying, Thou caitiff pope, confess, and behold the goodness of my lord, the king of France, who, though so far away from thee in his own kingdom, both watches over and defendeth thee by my hand. Thou art of heretic family, answered the Pope, at thy hands I look for martyrdom. The captivity of Boniface the Eighth, however, lasted only three days, for the people of Agnani, having recovered themselves, and seeing the scanty numbers of the foreigners, rose and delivered the Pope. The old man was conducted to the public square, crying like a child. 
"'Good folks,' said he to the crowd around him, "'ye have seen that mine enemies have robbed me of all my goods and those of the church. Behold me here as poor as Job. Not have I either to eat or drink. If there be any good woman who would give me an alms of wine and bread, I would bestow upon her God's blessing and mine.' All the people began to shout, "'Long live the Holy Father!' He was reconducted into his palace, and women thronged together thither, bringing him bread, wine, and water. Finding no proper vessels, they poured them into a chest, and any one who liked went in, and talked with the Pope, as with any other beggar. So soon as the agitation was somewhat abated, Boniface set out for Rome, with a great crowd following him, but he was broken down in spirit and body. Scarcely had he arrived when he fell into a burning fever, which traditions, probably invented and spread by his enemies, have represented as a fit of mad rage. He died on the 11th of October, 1303, without having recovered his reason. It is reported that his predecessor, Celestine V, had said of him, Thou risest like a fox, thou wilt rule like a lion and die like a dog. The last expression was unjustified. Boniface the Eighth was a fanatic, ambitious, proud, violent, and crafty, but with sincerity at the bottom of his prejudiced ideas, and stubborn and blind in his fits of temper, his death was that of an old lion at bay. End of chapter 18, part 14